James, James is absent. Sylvester, Sylvester is absent. Ida? Sadalkin. Keith? I saw Keith. Keith? Bye, Byron. <laughs> Yolanda? Garza Lopez. And Mike Frazier. The first thing we have to do before we actually go into the meeting is I have to read a paragraph about the Opens Meeting Act, the way we're going to do it today. <laughs> so what I need all board members and all people that are on the staff is to go and turn your mics off while I read this so it won't be any interference. So if you please just turn your mics off. If and during the course of the meeting, discussion of any item on the agenda should be held in the closed session. The board will contact, conduct a closed meeting in accordance with the Open Texas Vote, Open Meeting Act, Government Code, Chapter 551, Subchapter D and E. Before any closed meeting can be conveyed the pervading officer will publicly identify the section of the section of the act according to the closed meeting. All final votes, actions, or decisions will be taken in the open meeting. All right. How do I get all of them back now? Uh, just ask them to unmute. All right, they don't hear me, do they? They do. You're All on. right, everybody can go ahead and open yours back up. They don't hear me. I think we're we're here. We'll open up our mics when we want to speak, Mike. So okay. uh, you call call roll. You can turn it over to me at this point. Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to turn it over to Lloyd. But board members, what are we going to do as Lloyd uh, goes ahead and he'll get somebody to have the invocation. And then I want Ida to take the pledge and also the Texas pledge. I know, Lloyd, if you go ahead and somebody with the invocation. Yes, sir. So I just want to first uh, welcome you guys to this first kind of virtual uh, board work session. Uh, it is a public meeting and, and we may have other folks joining us from the public like we would do any uh, open public meeting. And so, uh, to uh, keep in our traditional uh, aspects, I'd like to invite Ms. Janice Hernandez to unmute her mic. She'll lead us in the invocation, uh, and then uh, we'll uh, have Ida lead us in the Pledge of Allegiances. Janice? Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Okay, let's begin. Father, as the events of the day continue to unfold, we seek your clarity and your peace during this time of uncertainty. We pray for our students, staff, community, frontline heroes, and all being affected by the current world situation, and that we soon find peace and normalcy. We know you are with us and for us as we gather together to seek your counsel. Come fully into our situation, both as a group and individually. Let our aims in this meeting be aligned with your direction. Let our plans be orchestrated by you. Let your will be done in this meeting so that this can be a meeting that is based upon your desire for us. Amen. Thank you, Janice. So now I think we'll stand. And I believe on our screen, we'll have an opportunity to uh, do our allegiances to our flags. Are you ready? No. Yes. Is the flag there? I don't see it. I think Dell's working on that. We can just face towards the flag. That's fine. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag the of the United States of America and to the Republic of the United States of America, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the United States, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about is the school calendar. 
And board members, at this time, I want you to turn your mics off. And during this session, I'm gonna turn it over to Lloyd. He's gonna have his person go ahead and present it. And if you have questions like we did when we were practicing, put those questions over in the right. And then we'll come back and I'll let you get your questions to whoever presents. But keep them off so there won't be any interference while they're presenting. Hey, guys. Right. The first thing, Lloyd, is the school calendar. Yeah, so uh, what I'd like to do, this is an action item uh, that uh, we inadvertently left off our last board meeting. We'd like to bring it uh, back. We don't like to do action items during our work sessions, but this is an important one. We have a lot of... Uh, issues that kind of uh, align with the starting of school next year and the end of school next year. And so I'd like to turn it over to Joanne. I believe she's gonna have Mr. Baker who did the uh, legwork on this to give some background uh, before you do take a vote. Joanne? Yeah, I think Will's online. Will, you can go ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you board members. Uh, we did go to the uh, district improvement team with uh, three draft calendars. They chose two to take to senior staff. We took those two calendars to senior staff and uh, they agreed to have those out for vote. And so we held a vote uh, with uh, the staff and over 1200 uh, uh, staff members voted and by 65%, uh, almost 65% voted for the option that Dale is displaying for you. It mirrors pretty much uh, our neighbors. Uh, we, we did choose the option that included the Easter Monday holiday again. So, uh, uh, we need to stop at this time and get Sylvester online if he's not. Mike, Mike, I'm on. On. Mike I'm, okay. on. I'm on, but I need to sign off. Uh, my dog just bit a little girl. Oh, no. Uh, okay. I need to attend to that. It just happened. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, I'll holler to you all later. Sorry, guys. All right, guys. Okay. All right, go on, Lloyd, with what you have. Or was that it? That, that was it, Mr. F uh, Mr. Frazier. Uh, that's that's the calendar that was chosen by the staff and recommended for the board to approve. All right, do I have a motion? Oh, you need to be turned on now. If you... I move. I have a second. I second. A motion has been made and seconded. Everybody in here, uh, board members, say aye. Aye. Motion carried. The motion carried. Mike, I don't, Flo just left. I don't know if we still have a quorum, do we? Flo left. We have four with me. If, uh, okay. Uh, Yolanda, here. Yolanda, Keith. I'm here. I'm here, Mike. I voted. Keith's here. We have four. Okay. The next thing we want to go into is item four, changing, changing the voting to November. Dr. Verstuff, if you go ahead and go with that. And we've seen the calendar a long time. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, this is an item uh, that Mr. Chris is going to bring. And of course, we know we're in unprecedented times right now. And uh, we are uh, uh, pretty much working remotely. And, and our students and teachers are, are teaching and learning uh, remotely. Um, and we do have uh, a stay home, work safe order in the city of San Antonio. That's uh, really having everyone uh, do things differently. And so uh, Mr. Crit is going to uh, announce the resolution uh, that we're looking for action on, uh, which is the official action uh, to move uh, the local trustee election uh, from the first Saturday in May uh, until the uh, next appropriate uh, voting opportunity. And so I'll turn it over to Mr. Chris. Uh, he's done the legwork on this uh, as well. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh Dale, can you, can you move to the order, Dale, on the, on the uh, presentation? Off the calendar. 
Yeah. One second. Well, while he's moving that, uh, on March 18, 2020, the uh, governor came out with a proclamation that provides school districts uh, the ability to postpone their local May 2nd uh, election uh, until November 2020. This helps to, to slow the spread of the COVID-19. Uh, any trustee whose term expired after the originally scheduled May 2nd local election will continue to serve uh, and retain their duties and powers of the office until an election is held and the trustee is either reelected or replaced by a newly elected trustee uh, who files a statement. Uh, per the Secretary of State, if a school district does postpone its election date, the school district district is preserving all candidate filings and ballots, order actions that have already been taken. Uh, such a postponement does not have the effect of reopening the candidate filings again. And so all those that actually turn in a, uh, an application will move forward. Uh, we won't be opening it back up due to the, what the order says. Uh, there was some... Uh, applications for ballot by mail that were probably sent in to Bear County uh, for those that were uh, mailed because of the age of 65 or due to a disability those will still be honored but for those that actually uh, asked for a ballot by mail because they were going to be out of the county those won't be valid so they'll be a, they'll have a chance to vote in, in November uh, so currently uh, it's a fluid situation I know there's, there's people talk uh, about possibly trying to change this to have the election earlier, maybe in the end of summer. But right now, according to the order, that's going to be at the uniform date in November. Uh, one change that's significant for us is that Bear County is the, uh, we host our own election and we do it jointly with Lytle uh, and working with Bear County. Bear County uh, will not be able to support us having our own in uh, in November because of the size and magnitude of their election uh, that goes on in November. So we would have to join and and be on a joint uh, election with Bear County at that point. Uh, and so that would change some of our sites and also early voting. And so I wanted to be transparent with everyone and let them know that's uh, we really wouldn't have a choice but to join uh, that election if it ends up on the November, November 3rd, 2020 election. So I wanted to just uh, let the board know that this is an order that has to be posted. It has to be approved by uh, the board members, uh, by the board, and then we will post this order. And then uh, as we get more information going into the summer for early voting, we have the dates, but we don't have the, the, the places yet. As we work with Bear County to figure those out, we will post those. Uh, there's some timelines that we have that happen uh, in late October that, to get all that going. And so that's really all I have. If there's questions, I'll take those now to answer them the best I can. Uh, but it is an order to move, postpone the May election to move to the November 3rd, 2020 uniform election date. Very open. Board members. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, is this uh, paperwork that you're showing us on the screen right now, is that in the packet or in the, uh, in the notice? Yes, yeah, so this is the agenda item. It's in the packet, but this is the order that um, I'm getting you to approve, like a resolution that I will have to post and send to uh, Bear County, and then I'll send this to the uh, Secretary of State, and then we'll post it on the website and on our, our buildings. Okay, so can you send us a copy of this as well then? Yes, and I, I put a copy of it in English and Spanish in there for you all to look at, but this will be the actual order that we have to okay, get. Okay, It's part of your board book, Yolanda. Uh, okay. Page seven, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions? I need a motion. I move. I second. Motion's been made and seconded. Everybody in favor say aye. 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 Mike, I think we have to do a roll for the vote. Okay. I guess it's got that bad. Uh, Flo, are you here? Sylvester, no. Ida? I vote yes. Keith? I vote yes. Yolanda? Yes. Flo? He said, she says she's going to retry. Interconnection is bad. Sorry, Interconnection is bad. All right. And I vote yes. So it carries. All right. Thank you. The next thing we're going to go into is items of information. Yes, Why sir. do you need 
you need a little time on this or you want to go right into it? I, I think we, we can go right into it. I, I want to thank you guys for uh, those two action items. Uh, they're, they're kind of timely and um, we appreciate your, your patience and being fluid uh, during this time. So this is our work session. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to get a little more in depth in, in a couple of areas. And, and so what we put together today is uh, we'd like to take an opportunity to uh, uh, really kind of hone in on uh, curriculum and instruction, uh, planning for next year, master schedule. Um, uh, also do a presentation status update uh, where we are in the uh, Tumusa Southwest ISD partnership, 1882. Uh, we'll bring uh, our board members up to date with that, where we are and what the process is happening now. And then we'd like to kind of just give an overall um, a COVID update. Um, really proud of the staff and, and especially our, our boots on the ground with our child nutrition transportation folks are just tremendous uh, in the leadership in, in the division. So we, we'd like to uh, give you guys an update with that. So I, I'd like to come back to uh, our first item of information. Uh, which is our master schedule and new courses uh, that we are having the dialogue conversation during planning. Uh, CNI uh, has is the lead division on this, and I'll turn it over to Dalila, and I'm sure uh, we're going to hear uh, from Zeline Aragon, uh, uh, who is our our executive director for secondary uh, curriculum, and uh, Chrissy Franco, our director for CTE in the district. So, Dalila, do you want to preface this or you want to turn it over to Zelina? Yes, um, I'm going to just go ahead and share that some of the work that is happening with the middle schools that is going to be shared is just to, in addition to the, what has already been put into place since last year. And then the same thing for the high school, we're just doing some restructuring of some of the courses, but I'm going to let Zelina continue with the presentation. Thank you, Dalila. Hello, everybody. Um, I wanted just to give an update. We are moving forward with the master schedule uh, recommendations and the work for, for next year. Uh, what we wanted to focus on for this year were uh, three items. Uh, one were the new courses that we are going to be talking uh, about. Uh, two are uh, core academic courses and the other ones are related to CTE. I do want to uh, let you know that we are going to be talking about a career exploration, a seventh grade investigating course, but that's uh, something we've always had a career exploration course for our middle schoolers. Uh, but we have some uh, ideas about rotations that are really going to focus in on the pathways at the high school. Uh, but English three on ramps, biology on ramps are two dual credit courses that we would like um, to offer at uh, Southwest Legacy High School. And then uh, the rest are innovative CTE courses. So I'll let Ms. Franco uh, continue with her CTE. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, so I'm just gonna do a, kick, a quick overview of the eight innovative CTE courses um, that we're adding. On the next slide, uh, Dale, if you don't mind moving forward. The first course is career prep. Some of you may have been familiar with this course. Um, I believe it, it, it was offered before. Um, so we're gonna kind of reignite it. Um, basically it's a work-based learning experience that will be offered to seniors, um, very similar to the um, old school work release type program. Um, it has been redesigned by um, TEA. So each student actually is given a training plan that's developed for uh, whatever job it is that they currently hold. And the teacher, ser the teacher of the class serves as a mentor that does check-ins with the employer, check-ins with the student. And then for the instruction part of the class, the, the teacher uh, does a lot of work with, you know, how to be a good employee, um, how to uh, be promoted within the company that you're working for, just th those type of things. Um, and in order for a student to be able to participate in career prep, uh, there is the um, requirement that their job be a paid position. So this couldn't be an internship that is not paid. Um, the other courses um, are very, it's a very simple add. Um, currently, they're all um, pretty much under the aviation 
spectrum. So in our current aviation program of study, um, all of the courses are being ran under a course called Science Research and Design. Uh, with, the, with the move that TEA has made with the new Perkins 5 grant, uh, we are required to offer certain courses within a program of study. So within our aviation program, we were already offering those courses. They just weren't listed as that specific course because uh, TEA just hadn't created them yet. And so any of the aviation courses that you're going to see on the, the list are just us signifying what exactly they're doing in the course per TEA requirements now that they have the courses. Um, the other courses you're gonna see on there, you're going to see two cosmetology courses. One is the uh, study of microbiology in Cosmo Careers, as well as a nail, a nail care course. Uh, those courses were being added just as supplemental for students that were interested in um, getting uh, additional uh, certifications in the cosmetology program of study. And then the last course that is on the list that you have is called uh, Legal and Research Writing. Uh, we just are adding a new course to our legal studies program of study. And then um, the next slide, please, Dell, if you would. So the next slide is what Zeline was referring to as the Investigating Careers course. Um, as she said, we have already had this course, but we're redesigning the curriculum. Uh, we want to make sure that our middle school students are given more information um, and more exposure to the programs of study that they will be offered once they enter their feeder high school. And so we will be uh, kind of redoing the curriculum, really spicing up the, the course so that um, we're able to give students um, a better background so that when they do choose their endorsement or program of study, that they know that they're making a sound choice and, and what exactly they'll be studying for possibly the next four years. And so the, um, the CTE programs of study rotation is, is listed on the slide. Uh, some of them are the same for each of the middle schools because uh, some of the programs of study at each of the high schools are the same. So if you see uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 just stand for the each of the nine weeks, the quarter. Um, so we want to make sure that Cyber Patriots and Automation uh, students get a good overview of both of those programs. Um, business, and then we wanted to add a financial literacy piece because we know that that is an area that we definitely want to grow our students in as they uh, move forward with their education. Um, health science is on both uh, feeder patterns because the Health Science Academy is open to all of our students. Um, and then you'll see the slight difference there in quarter three, animal science um, for McNair and SCOBY, since we do have our animal science and ag program at uh, Southwest High School. And then you'll see culinary um, in quarter three for McNair and Resnick, as we do have our culinary program at Legacy. And then you'll see aviation and digital arts for quarter four for McNair and SCOBY. Digital arts will cover things such as um, uh, little bits of AV, uh, little bits of graphic design. And then uh, over at McNair and Resnick, they'll get an exploratory uh, four weeks in photography as we do have our photography program of study at Legacy. And then they also will cover uh, digital arts as well. And then um, I noticed the, um, my CTE pathways is missing here. I can just pull it up if we need to. It's right there. Uh, it's the link. Oh, it's the link. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thank you so much. So while Adele is pulling that up, um, what you're about to see is just a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison of the current uh, CTE pathways. And next year, um, and we've really been trying to get in the habit of uh, TEA has changed the word pathways to programs of study. Um, and so what we're going to do is show you what we currently have, um, what we would like to add. We'd like to add a few additional ones for next year, 
uh, to kind of increase the offerings that our students are exposed to. And then um, a couple that we are recommending to um, either redesign or get rid of due to um, low enrollment or um, it may be that the course isn't, uh, isn't one of the ones that is really growing in our area. Um, we're trying to get that back up, but the, back. the uh, spreadsheet with the side-by-side -side of programs of study was included in the board background. So you can see oh, okay. uh, the comparison for all three high schools as we're trying to get that up for you. Okay, so can I just go ahead and talk about it, Zeline? Yes, for, for those who may have a hard copy or, or a digital copy of the board book today, it's page 18. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Chrissy. Okay, great. Okay, so can you all still hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so if you take a look um, to the left, starting with Southwest Programs of Study, the ones that are, are falling under 1920 are the ones that we have this year, and then 2021 are the ones that are proposed. So I'm just going to go through them quickly. Um, no change to Ag Diesel Mechanic. No change to agriculture fabrication. Uh, no change to aviation regional. Um, no change to cosmetology regional. No change to construction carpentry. Um, there's a little bit of change in how we are organizing the Health Science Academy. Um, next year, we are going to have three specific avenues that a student will choose from. We will have a healthcare diagnostics EKG healthcare diagnostics phlebotomy, and then healthcare therapeutic patient care technician. The patient care technician is the more rigorous route in the program. We wanted to make sure that we offered uh, different levels based on uh, student choice. And um, so patient care technician, uh, that certification, they will actually get EKG and phlebotomy in that strand as well. Um, so what that is, is that means that for next year, um, if you look to the left, uh, this year we did try out the medical billing and coding. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to see the uh, certification testing because um, at this point in time, that test can only be uh, proctored. And so um, the students, um, Right now, uh, it's just depending on if they get to take that certification test if we return by the end of the year. If we don't return, um, they won't be able to take it this year. Um, the uh, If you go down the personal trainer course, uh, we had very few students that um, wanted to enroll in that this year. Um, and when we surveyed the students that are coming up next year, um, very few students chose that option, so we don't think that um, there's a lot of student interest in that area, so we won't be uh, pursuing that um, after this year. We are, um, it's kind of the same situation with the certification. Um, we did want to make sure because students were, um, it was advertised at the beginning of the year um, that they could still get this certification. So that's why we, we kept it this year, even though the numbers were a bit low, because we wanted to serve those students that, um, that had signed up for that. Um, so moving on, uh, cybersecurity, this is just a, a program of study name change. Before it was called information technology, but our program really is more centered towards cybersecurity. So I felt that the name change was um, more with the times and more descriptive as to what we are actually offering. Um, keeping law enforcement, uh, veterinarian studies and animal science, the proposed new offerings. Um, and these are uh, of course, dependent on the number of students that sign up. If there is a student interest would be business management, graphic design, teaching and training and legal studies. Legal studies, we kind of already have in place, but the flow of the classes wasn't correct according to what we were doing for program of studies. And so that's why we um, we were proposing to add that research and legal writing class because that corrects the uh, sequence of courses. And then the potential removals are right there um, to the left. It says removal for 2021. 
Um, that would be the removal of the CNA program, the personal trainer, and the medical billing and coding. And then over to legacy. Um, so uh, we have automotive collision repair stays the same. Auto tech stays the same. Uh, business admin, the only change is before we had business admin and business finance. Um, we are going to uh, combine both of the programs because of enrollment numbers. Uh, photography, the only change there is it used to be called per, uh, commercial photography. And um, I changed the name just to photography uh, because they do more than commercial photography. Um, of course, we have our cosmetology program that started this year and will continue for next year at Legacy. Culinary arts stays the same. Audio video, AV stays the same. Education and training stays the same. Uh, engineering is currently being redesigned to a renewable energy pathway. And we may be offering two routes in this program of study uh, based on uh, what the student enrollment looks like for next year. We're really excited about uh, where that program is going. Um, graphic design stays the same. Welding stays the same. And then two proposed new uh, programs of study for Legacy would be, um, I should have put, um, I thought I put cybersecurity. It should say cybersecurity. I apologize, my mistake on that part. Um, and then uh, law enforcement. The potential removal for 2021 would be business and finance because we're combining it with business administration. And then the removal of animation because animation is already embedded in graphic design. Um, and then if you, uh, if you look, there are no changes currently to the cast in programs of study. Those will still be engineering, global logistics, advanced manufacturing, and power and energy. So and thank you, Chrissy. So, Board, I just want yeah. to add here that maybe Chrissy can speak to this. So when we're bringing this information, uh, our this is on top of uh, our core curriculum uh, advanced uh, uh, academic opportunities for students. So this is a, a pretty strong uh, CTE pathway uh, program of studies that we're looking at. So. Uh, we started four years ago by limiting some things between the high schools, and, and now it's about how four years later, how can we expand it back so all of our students have access to certain programs of study. Uh, we know that we're in a very difficult time right now uh, with what's happening in our nation, in our state, and in our school district. Uh, we fully anticipate that uh, the revenue streams that we have this year will not be available next year. So when we're bringing this information to you, uh, we're talking about programs and not uh, asking for uh, FTEs. We're not asking for people. Uh, these things we can do with existing staff or, or uh, through attrition. Uh, so when you see new things, I know something that may come up in your head. Well, uh, does that require a new teacher? The answer to you is no. Uh, we're doing these with existing staff and through attrition uh, to make these uh, programs available at both of our high schools. I just wanted to add that, Chrissy. Lloyd, uh, Yolanda have, has a question. Yes, Yolanda has a question, and evidently we have a lot of stuff coming in where they don't have their uh, mics turned off. Let's try to keep our mics turned off while the person is speaking. But go ahead, Yolanda. Yolanda, are you up? Can you hear me? Yolanda. Yolanda, can you hear me? You're muted, Yolanda. Yolanda. Hang on, I have her question. Let me get it. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Okay, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I have a problem with my mute button. It 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 uh, takes a lot of clicking for it to to unmute. Uh, my first question is on the finance one. Is that um, personal finance or is that uh, going to be like like for businesses finance? Uh, yes, ma'am. Are you referring to the uh, seventh grade course? Or are you referring to the business courses at the high school level? I guess both, because if we're going to be doing finance, wouldn't we want to align the middle schools with the high school anyway? 
Uh, the, yes, ma'am, we definitely are uh, striving toward alignment. So the biz, the financial literacy course that um, that will be well the financial literacy curriculum that will be a part of the seventh grade investigating careers course is actually more about uh, checking accounts, credit cards, um, savings account, like basic overview to kind of introduce them to their personal finance. The okay. business um, the business courses at the high school should they choose that program of study do incorporate a great deal of accounting. And um, also uh, they make references, of course, to their personal finance, but it's more about how a business is ran. Okay. So there will be no personal uh, business component at the high school level when the kid, when, you know, when the kids are older and they're starting to, you know, go to work, make their own money. Um, are we uh, gonna incorporate any of that? Um, one of the things that uh, we've talked about in CNI is what are we going to um, provide as far as um, personal finance education? So yes, ma'am, we've been looking into uh, what what's the best way for all students to receive that, whether they're in CTE or not. Um, but for the business, the program of study, the actual TEKS and the curriculum that align with it, aren't um, aren't a hundred percent aligned to what we need to offer our students for financial literacy but yes we um, we are definitely exploring that um, I know Dalila has mentioned several times um, and so uh, and I can you know I can be a part of that exploration but for the program of study itself um, it just doesn't take up most of the teaks and that's for um, any of the programs of study, not just the one that uh, was chosen for business. Okay. And then the second question is um, on the the legal one. Is that um, like a for like a paralegal class? Um, it's not for a paralegal currently. Okay. Uh, we don't have uh, well, CEA doesn't have a certification in that area. It's more about students that are interested in going pre law once they get to okay. college. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Ida, do you have a question? No, sir, I don't. Does anybody else have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. You mentioned the renewable energy course. Could you tell me a little bit about what that what that is, or what the what kind of renewable energy? you're talking about? Yes, sir. We are looking at um, really, really moving forward with our solar powered, um, especially in the, uh, the cars the, that we race. And we are also currently exploring an option with St. Phillips. St. Phillips has a new program where they are certifying their students to become solar panel installate, install Installators, I'm <laughs> sorry, I didn't think about it. I said that. Um, and they also are building fuel cells that are powered for 18 wheelers. So we're looking at solar mostly, and then there will be a, another uh, incorporation into um, how. Uh, I'm sorry, we're we're looking into a partnership with Philip in order to increase the opportunities that our students have while they're in high school. Um, and through St. Phillips, they can also get the solar panel installation and the fuel cell installation before they graduate high school if they're successful. Okay, anybody else have questions, board members? I have no. one more, Mike. This I'm is your I have one more. I didn't see the welding on there. Are we still gonna do welding? Yes, ma'am, welding was uh, all the way at the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I see. Yeah, we're Thank doing you. that. The kids love that program of study. Thank you. Okay, I have one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, and it, it has to do with the uh, renewable uh, energy. Uh, it, so you're trying to train technicians to work uh, in the field to prepare renewable energy systems. Is that right? Is 
Is that a fair way to say it? Yes, sir. That is absolutely right. Okay. I'm not sure that you're not uh, narrowing down your potential uh, clients uh, uh, too much when you say renewable energy. You know, it's a wide field, and most of the work is not done in renewable. But, I mean, it's okay, and I'm not saying not to do it, but I'm, I am saying that I'm not sure it's thought out that well, maybe from the state perspective. Uh, I mean, probably uh, I, my own view is that uh, renewable in, uh, in uh, solar is the least technical and the least demanding of all of them. I recognize that there are skills that you've got to have, but they're relatively simple skills compared to what like you did, uh, you know, what electricians do or welders do or something else. So I, I just throw out kind of a caution as we move forward in these kinds of things. Sometimes these kinds of things are the fad and we're all going to them and everybody's going to be doing them and the state wants to do them, but it's not really helping anybody. So I just have you think about that as you move forward. Thank you. Yes, sir, most definitely. All right, I need a, well, there's not a motion on this, but uh, Dr. Verstoff, do you want to go ahead with the second item? Well, the, these are all items information. Uh, we will bring uh, action items in the future. Uh, but yeah, I think that kind of covers the presentation as far as what we're looking at in CTE moving forward. Uh, of course, we all know that we're in this unknown time and, uh, um, you know, revenue implications. We may be coming back to present something different in the future. Uh, right now, there's a lot of unknowns, but we still want to plan for the future. And, and we know we're going to come back to school. Uh, at what rate coming back is going to be the question. Uh, but this is our thinking right now. We wanted to present that to our trustees to let you know what we're trying to do uh, on the line. Uh, our next item, uh, Mr. President, is um, the continuation of our dialogue and conversation uh, around the potential partnership with uh, Southwest ISD and uh, uh, with our neighboring higher education uh, institution, Texas A&M University in uh, the state of Texas. And so um, Zelina is gonna spend some time uh, going through uh, kind of the next phase, more information uh, to let you guys know uh, where things are right now, a uh, high elevation. Uh, we have kind of uh, three entities uh, that are working kind of uh, parallel train track. Uh, so uh, we have the performance contract uh, which I've uh, provided uh, copies to you guys of the working drafts moving forward. It, it changes. It changes day to day, uh, week to week, hour to hour sometimes. Uh, so where that performance contract, that would be the actual document uh, that you as a governing board of trustees would contract with this entity uh, related uh, to Texas A&M University uh, to achieve the objectives uh, that we want to achieve over the next five years. Uh, within that contract. And so it kind of lays out parameters of what's the role of the district, the role uh, of the uh, operating partner, which would be Tamusa. And uh, where that document is right now, it's, it's with uh, uh, our attorneys, uh, our attorney, uh, Eddie Perez, uh, David Thompson, uh, a well-known attorney out of Houston, who's working with the state and Texas A&M's attorney to kind of hash out the, the legal uh, aspects of that contract, it's going back and forth. Uh, but uh, as soon as we get uh, kind of their legal eyes and, and everyone dots the I and crosses the T's, I'll get that back out uh, to you guys for review. Uh, so it's not complete, uh, but it definitely has gone on to the next phase. And we've been able to add our language uh, about uh, uh, how we think it's important uh, to have a, if we're going to do this, what we are after is a, a deeper, more meaningful partnership uh, who, uh, working with Texas A&M, can open up opportunities for our teachers to get additional credentialing and, and master level degrees and create a, a more seamless uh, pipeline of our students uh, matriculating from high school into uh, higher education uh, and into career. Uh, so uh, we're working those things out. 
the other component that we are working on uh, right now, and I, and I think Zeline will reference this quite a bit uh, when she comes on to do her presentation, is uh, the actual uh, proposal from Texas A&M. Uh, and right now that proposal has gone on to a, a reviewing committee in our district to kind of uh, go through and, and make sure uh, that that committee collectively thinks that uh, by uh, uh, following this framework that our students would be in a better trajectory uh, in, in literacy and in math and in sciences uh, to achieve the objectives. And so they are looking at that. My understanding is uh, that committee uh, has submitted uh, uh, four to five page questions to back to uh, Tamusa. Uh, and Tamusa is in the process working with the consultant Maya to uh, modify parts of the proposal. And then it's going back in front of the committee tomorrow to have a verbal conversation. And so that's ongoing as well. And that's where we're going to bring everyone up to speed where that is right now. Uh, and then there's uh, another uh, uh, formal application process uh, that is submitted to TEA uh, to kind of officialize uh, in the event that the board approves this and it moves forward and, and we have a performance contract. And so uh, HR has stepped in. Uh, and, and the folks in HR, uh, Mr. Kadoris and Mr. Dreesey are actually doing the legwork, working with uh, Dr. Fay and, and Ms. Garcia and company to uh, complete that uh, little application process. And so those things are going on too. And so our goal today is to provide the board more information about where we are uh, in the process, uh, which if you look at it from those three big rocks, that's where we are. Uh, it's ongoing, it's fluid, uh, there's conversations still happening. Uh, of course, we had a little kind of off-ramp here about three weeks ago that kind of stopped everything. Uh, the state of Texas did move the application deadline from March 31st to April 30th, or from March 30th to April 30th. Uh, and so uh, we know we continue to do the work, uh, knowing that that timeline or that deadline had been uh, uh, move to the end of April, but there's still a lot of work to, to happen. So I'd like to turn it over to Dalila Zaline right now, uh, and we'll kind of present to you and answer any questions we can. But just understand we're bringing this back uh, to the board uh, April 21st, uh, in a more formal process. Uh, and if we're ready to make a recommendation at that point, we feel we'll do it. If not, we would have a few more days to call a special meeting uh, to, to present that just as a solo item. Wait a minute, you got some questions. Okay. Ida, you have the first one. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know um, where we were on the free tuition. Uh, on the what, Ida? I didn't hear the last part. The free college tuition. Yes, uh, that uh, in my conversations with Dr. Shapiro, uh, they are looking to pilot an opportunity uh, as a uh, promise scholarship and uh, they're looking to do that, pilot it with a district, uh, predominantly on the south side, and uh, he is uh, adamant that that is a go. Uh, if we were to bring this to for he's not using it as a you know ultimatum, uh, but if we have this strong partnership, it would seem to align naturally that we would do this promise scholarship for students graduating from Southwest ISD. He has uh, verbally committed to that. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then Yolanda has a question. Yes, oh, yeah. he answered her first one. Yolanda, go ahead with your second one. Um, well, and I, I want to ask about the free tuition. Is, there, is it for all students or 100 students or 10 students? Do we know what he's thinking? I, I don't know the exact details uh, in, in the conversations and, and me just kind of reading the tea leaves. It would be for all uh, senior or all graduates starting in uh, 2021 uh, that want to uh, uh, go to Texas A&M University. So my short answer to you is all at this point. Okay. And then my other questions are, uh, when do you expect to get the document back from the lawyers? Um, I would expect by the middle of next week, we'll have a pretty good uh, document. It may still be in draft uh, form, uh, but I feel like today we're about 80 to 90% there. 
Okay. And I would think that after the next uh, a week from a week and a day from today, uh, we should be at least uh, north of 95 percent. OK, and then the, my last question is um, who was on the committee that is um, that is uh, vetting all this? The review committee. Uh, I'll let Aline. Uh, we have some really good folks uh, on that committee uh, doing a, uh, a great job. Uh, I can let Zaline. I can, I can tell you uh, the folks I know. I know that Amanda Wagner, uh, who is an academic dean in our district, uh, is on that committee. Uh, we have Jesse Garcia. Our executive director of community outreach is on that committee. Uh, we have uh, 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 interim dean uh, Rick Gonzalez from UIW. Uh, mm -hmm. A good friend. He's done some great things in Southwest. Uh, we're happy to have him on that committee. Uh, and I know there's a few others. I can't think of them off the cuff, but I'm sure Zaline are, can talk to the other are the, are the principals of the high schools involved on the committee? Um, Wait, go ahead, Zaline. Okay, um, the last person on the committee is Bonnie Robinson. Uh, part of the guidelines is if um, Mr. Guidry was part of the design team, we cannot be part of the committee, the capacity interview committee okay. that's making that final application. Okay. And is there any parent representation on that committee? Um, just the uh, parent representation has been the input that we have received from the uh, community meetings we've held. So that is part of the participation uh, from parents at this point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. But our internal committee is Jesse, Bunny Robinson, Amanda Wagner, and our external is uh, Dr. Rick Gonzalez from okay. UIW. So why don't I turn it over to, uh, if it's okay with you all, to Zaline or Dalila? Yes, sir. Zaline, uh, you can go ahead. Okay. Zaline, go ahead. Then we'll open um, it back up for questions. Yes, so while the capacity interview committee has been uh, vetting the application, um, this update deals with the TSIA update. Um, as we are looking at the needs of Legacy High School as they've been continuing to meet with A&M, uh, we really wanted to focus on what the TSIA enrichment program would look like. Um, so again, um, all this information um, is from the uh, uh, proposal that was included in your background. They did have some updates um, this week um, as of last night. Um, so I will be speaking to those um, in the, uh, I added some uh, slides so you could have the most updated information. But right now the TSIA enrichment program is uh, geared for one week. Um, it could also be an ex extended to two weeks um, with, of course, we know that our students have different needs, have jobs and different responsibilities. So that part uh, was uh, built to be flexible so we could ensure we had uh, students participating. Uh, we'll also be touching on teacher feedback and then also um, the math, reading, and writing focus. Okay, Dale, you can move forward, please. Um, so here you see is the um, example of the board background uh, that you have. Um, Dale, the um, the presentation is the one I sent you this morning. Chrissy's presentation was the only one that I got this morning. Um, it was shared to you. It was um, shared directly from the document. Give me just a moment. share it with you. I'm sure you received a bunch of emails since. Um, so as Dale is um, preparing the uh, to project, um, we had a meeting this past week with the uh, design team from A&M. So we went over some of the needs that uh, we have experienced over the past couple of years of uh, administering the TSI. Um, so one of the uh, different approaches um, that is included in the proposal 
is uh, a project-based approach um, to looking at the skills that are needed to pass the uh, TSI. Um, so what you're looking at right now are the uh, actual skills and content uh, that had been identified for the different content areas. So this is what was added from the newly updated information that was received yesterday from a and um, So for reading, it's a lot of, of structure, inferences, uh, vocabulary, analysis that's included for the college ready content and skills. Writing is really focusing on that five paragraph essay. And then in mathematics, you have a focus uh, that's building upon one another with elementary algebra, intermediate algebra, and then geometry and measurement. Um, so what the, um, the next slide that you see is an example of what the teacher PD, a sample of the schedule, what it would look like. Uh, a and has focused on three areas of instruction uh, that have to do with classroom monitoring, student engagement, and then the guidelines. So teachers would experience uh, a four day, um, nine to 12 schedule focusing on the different parts of TSIA for reading and writing. And the next one, I'll, I'll show you the math one. But on the fifth day, um, they would have an opportunity to prep and get ready for instruction for students. And then uh, the next slide shows a sample of what the math would look like, uh, focusing on those three areas. And then also that last day would give them uh, prep time to focus on the enrichment program. Um, the next slide that you see will, is a sample of what the student schedule would look like for those five days, so very similar to what the uh, teacher schedule looks like on the next slides. Um, but one thing that we have emphasized to a and um, as we are looking at um, the student schedules is that on the fifth day, they would go ahead and um, take the TSIA exam. However, we know uh, from experience that some of our students do take longer than three hours. So we are asking uh, a and to allow uh, for longer periods of test taking time and multiple days for our students who are taking the TSIA exam. So for example, you have there a nine to 12. So that would be open to a student to take um, all day if needed, if they needed that extra time. Uh, the next slide you see is the math example. You see that if somebody's uh, needing reading and writing, you would, uh, they would go in the morning and then at uh, in the afternoon would be the math focus on those three areas. And then again, we are asking for time, extended time for students who are going to be uh, needing uh, extra time to take the exam. Uh, and I believe there's a question from one of the board members that what do we mean by authentic uh, pedagogy? Uh, really what they're asking is um, to create projects uh, based on what their current pathway is. So if I'm somebody in welding and uh, construction, then my project would be on measurement of uh, building a house, for example. Um, if I'm more of a humanities based, um, let's say I'm a, a fine arts, then it would be based on my endorsement. So um, that's what it means when they are talking about authentic pedagogy. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so these are the samples of uh, schedules that a and has provided. Uh, we are asking again for um, extra time for the students. Um, also, another example of uh, what students would be asked to do is uh, produce the project base, which would include slam poetry, a mini documentary, a short story, a one person performance uh, are just some examples of what our students would be asked to complete in addition to the um, enrichment that they would be receiving for TSI. Do we have any other questions? No, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I, I want to thank the uh, campus teams and the, the district teams for working together um, to create uh, the, the uh, opportunities for our students. So thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for this short notice on getting on to this. So, Mr. Frazier, can I ask if there's uh, any other uh, questions. I, I know we're going to continue to bring this item back to the board and 
it's ongoing. And I know I've been in contact with Mr. Dr. Shapiro today. And so there's a lot of moving parts and, and we'll continue. But is there anything that we can try to answer uh, for any of the trustees right now in reference to that item? Okay. You're talking about the Texas A&M, Lloyd? Yes, the partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, the partnership yes. If not, we'll continue bringing more information. Uh, but at some point, uh, we will be for, uh, forming that into uh, a formal board action in the future. Uh, but we don't feel we're prepared to do that just yet. Uh, on another item, I've talked to Dr. Shapiro uh, in reference to the governing structure around uh, that opportunity. Uh, uh, there are uh, some board members for that nonprofit uh, that are associated uh, with uh, Texas A&M University, and then there's some that are external. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Shapiro has made contact uh, with Dr. Viegas and, and Dr. Clifford and uh, has uh, affirmed with Dr. Viegas and is waiting to have contact with Dr. Clifford at this point in time. So uh, Texas A&M is very open. Um, uh, there uh, are exceptional people, I think, there, and and so we're trying to figure this thing out uh, by creating the best pathway forward uh, in in putting our kids in a better trajectory earlier, earlier, uh, and putting giving our teachers opportunity uh, to have uh, additional credentials to support our students at a different level as well. So, so we keep moving. I just want you to know that. Well said. Okay. No questions? We'll go on to item three. You're up again. Yes, sir. So this is uh, uh, our item, information item. Uh, just to give the board, I, I know you guys get a, a number of contacts and phone calls about what's happening here and there. And uh, I just want to say before I, I turn this over, there are a lot of specific people who have been involved in just completely changing uh, the education venue platform uh, practically overnight from one week to the next. You know, we we went out on spring break and we never really kind of returned physically uh, in the sense of uh, what traditional school looks like. Uh, but we did have to take what we do and put it in a, a remote uh, environment. And, you know, I'm very proud of the senior leadership, uh, division leaders uh, and, and department leaders and those folks who have really kind of moved mountains to make it happen. Uh, and extremely proud of our, our child nutrition folks who are just troopers and, and they have service hearts. And uh, because of them, our kids uh, in our community are in a better position uh, to go to the next day and we keep going forward. And so it's not the most positive thing that happened to us, but I think our, our attitude is very positive. We move forward. We know we're going to get back to normal. We know we're going to get beyond this, uh, but why we're in it and we want to do the best we can. Uh, for our communities, for our parents, and, and for the children that we serve. And I know that's your your uh, objective as well. Uh, so we'd like to give you an update. And, and uh, our director uh, of health services, uh, Valerie Maldonado, she'll start. And uh, we'll hear from uh, Mark Figueroa on the operational side uh, and Brandon Crisp uh, on our child nutrition uh, and finance side. And then I'll kind of wrap it up. Uh, but we'd just like to tell you what we we are doing uh, what are we think our next steps may be and uh, answer any of your questions. So Val, are you there? I'm here, Dr. Versta. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members. So I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell you all the state of COVID-19 in our, our state, but I'm going to just recap it really quickly. Um, we have more than 8,000 cases here in Texas. Um, here in San Antonio, Bear County, we have 456 cases. Um, 139 of those, or 30%, are uh, known to be community transmitted. 12 deaths, but while I don't want to harp on the deaths, I want you all to know also 77 people have recovered. So, so there is hope um, that we will definitely get over this. Um, I did want to mention that a few of our zip codes have high cases like the 78245 zip code. We have 17 to 20 cases 
in in that zip code and then following that in our 78242 and 78211 zip codes we have five to eight cases and with many other um cases in other zip codes so what does that mean that basically means it is here we know that it's in our community and we just have to be extra cautious during this time um we have worked really hard um, and, and I'm just going to echo the words of Dr. Verstiff really quickly, a, a shout out to Child Nutrition Services, to our Transportation Department, those who are really on the front lines helping to serve the needs of our community. And with that, we have implemented some safety measures to ensure that they're being safe. Um, we have come up with some signs to, to post at those sites. So that way, not only our staff members are reminded on, on how to be safe during this time, but also our, our community members. So we have a social distancing sign that encourages and emphasizes the need to practice that social distancing, staying six feet away from one another. Um, we also have- Valerie. Yes. Well, I, I sent those signs to Dale, hoping he could pull those up so we could show those. Okay, there, there yeah. you go, perfect. Thank you, thank you and thank you, Mark. So we also have um, the tips to help stop the spread of COVID-19. And we know that this is a very fluid situation. Um, things change from day to day. We know that at first masks weren't recommended only for, for healthcare workers, really, if you were healthy, they weren't recommending that you wear masks, whereas that has changed now to um, the recommendation nationally and locally to wear masks when you're out in public. So we have provided masks for our staff. Um, they have the access to that. We also have hand sanitizer out there. Again, just a reminder to stay home when you're sick, keep six feet away from each other. Those simple uh, practices that all of us need to really be um, enacting right now during this time. Do I have, are there any questions for me? Okay, then I'm gonna hand it over to Mark. Yeah, Val Valerie's been really critical as a, our health leader in making sure everyone understands uh, the protocols and, and our expectations. I really uh, commend her. Uh, Mark, operationally? Uh, yes, uh, and just to follow up with Valerie's uh, signs, uh, we have those at not only all of our elementary curbside uh, locations, but also at our eight neighborhood satellite locations. So we have uh, distributed them, and those are are present and, and pretty visible by anybody that's coming to pick up the mail. So thanks to our print shop for putting those up with short notice. Um, from this point on, uh, I'll go ahead and take over uh, and working with Mr. Crisp with uh, supporting our child nutrition program. Uh, originally, we started at our uh, six elementaries, then grew it to eight, and uh, we are currently at 10 elementaries, and we are approximately serving around 9,000 lunches and breakfast daily. So combined meals, we're looking at about 9,000 uh, meals that we're giving out to our community. Uh, we have eight satellite sites that we have uh, sent out, uh, that we have actually set up, I should say. Um, I, Dale has that uh flyer that's up right there it is updated uh so last week we did add four more in the neighborhood areas and strategically located at the four corners of the district uh what has been a big help to us is of course our transportation bus drivers are manning those uh daily and uh we have now been able to to get some support from from our athletic department we asked for support they stepped up they've done a wonderful job of kind of taking the lead and helping to uh build the community relationships, helping to monitor what's going on to ensure that we have the social distancing going on at our sites. Uh, we have our school nurses that are also making rounds at the different sites, both the campuses and the uh, satellite sites, as well as Valerie and I are rotating uh, daily at those sites. Uh, so any questions that, that or any concerns that they have, they need additional PPE equipment, personal protective equipment, we are distributing those as requested uh, to both the kitchen staff as well as uh, anybody that's, that's giving out the meals. Questions on the meals before I move forward? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, how did we work out the extra requirements that were required by the federal government in order to give out the mail? So, Yolanda, I'll touch on that for Brendan. Uh, okay. Previously, we, we didn't turn anybody away. Uh, 
But we are part we of the summer of the program. program. Some of the uh, going. I think Dr. Barham, if you can mute there. Uh, some of the yeah. some of the rules previously in the summer feeding program is that the students had to be present to receive meals, uh, and then we got guidance last week on that. We hadn't turned anybody away, so we've been kind of out of compliance on that. Uh, but luckily, they came out with some new guidance to say you don't have to have uh, ch children or students with you, but uh, they still are requiring some form of identification. So if you're a parent and you have three children and you show up to a site, you get all your meals because the kids are in the car uh, or they walk up. If you are a parent and you don't want to bring your students, there has to be some form of identification. The TDA has laid those out. Uh, and one of the forms would be like a report card or progress report, a school ID, or even a birth certificate. And so they just pull up and show those and we will give them the meals. There is a positive to that. Uh, we have seen, we are serving over 9,000 meals, but we are seeing people get seven to 10 to 12 meals. Uh, and so I know we don't, we trust people, but at the same time, uh, we have our own kind of hoarding happenings in some places, mm -hmm. people going to other sites. So we're trying to help mitigate that it's helping because we have our, our logistical issues as well supplies that mm -hmm. we're trying to maintain uh and at the same time uh you know we, we've expanded uh mm -hmm. and with expansion we put a huge burden on supplies and also uh personnel uh our our, our child nutrition department in a normal day they serve this about the same amount of meals but it's different because they're used to prepping the meals and then putting on the serving line what they're having to do is they're having to bag all this stuff and put mm -hmm. it in my chest, get it loaded, move it to the front of the school. And so it's a lot of a, a excessive work that they're not used to. And it's 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 quite a production. And so we're we're dealing with safety. We're dealing with fear. We're dealing with uh, different types of, uh, of, of work environment. Uh, and so we're monitoring our, our child nutrition department, our tr transportation department. We have our head custodians coming in to do this. And we're we're trying to find a way to to meet the needs of our community and serving foods. But at the same time, uh, serving our employees. And so we're going to look to try to go to three days a week coming up uh, to, to help them with uh, the safety protocols and, and the fear that's out there as we get more uh, cases in our neighborhoods. Uh, giving them less contact with people would be great. And the other part is it's a, it's a hard, it's hard work. And so giving them uh, a, a day or two there where they don't have to just come in and package meals all morning. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to look at that. And so we're going to be dealing with this and we, we started yesterday with the identification and to be truthful yesterday and today we actually are seeing lower numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if it has to do with the new stipulations, but we don't want to turn people away. Uh, but also, I will tell you that because we're serving 9000 meals, that's $30,000 of reimbursable meals a day. Mm -hmm. So every day we're out of compliance, that's $30,000 that the district would lose if, if we weren't in compliance. And so that adds up. Even up to, to this point, we're about that's about six hundred thousand dollars that we've already would be getting reimbursed for from when we started after March after spring break. And so if this continues, those funds and those reimbursements are gonna be very vital to the child nutrition program to sustain it, or we're gonna have to look for other uh funding elsewhere. Uh that that kind of covers that. I don't know if that answered your question, but we're 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 trying to do it the best we can to be uh uh have good customer service, but at the same time we're gonna have people upset about it. We're going to try to figure out a ways to uh, help them get a report card or pro progress report or some form of ident identification. We put the task to the principals and a lot of them responded. So we're going to work through those. Uh, but at the same time, we're trying to make sure that we get reimbursed because there is a business side to this uh, and, and, and make sure that we get the funding so that we can still support the program with buying supplies and paying our employees as this thing, if it gets prolonged, we can uh, uh, afford it as a district. Right. Well, I would certainly, my only comment to that would be that I would want us to make sure that we are helping and facilitating for families that might hit a snag, but they're legitimate, right? Because there's people out there that legitimately might have, you know, multiple children and, you know, birth certificates are expensive. If you lose them, you have to pay for them to get them. And if, you know, the report cards, you know, I, you know, I didn't, the report cards, I would, you know, look at them and like throw them away. I only kept the last one for the year. So yeah. if, you know, if there's any legitimate reason that a parent is, um, you know, if we can just confirm and then, you know, right. give we're, them we're, a document that allows them to be able to get the food for their kids because these kids are our kids, right? Correct. And so we're looking for solutions within to help parents 
mitigate that and navigate through that. Uh, and I know we have a, a group that's really looking at it to see how they can make it as easy as possible. Because we actually want it to be easy for us as well as we get sure. parents coming in and having them five different identifications. And so we're going to work through it uh, and do the very best we can. I promise you that. I know that. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, sir. Uh, are all board members on now? Yolanda's here. Anybody else? I'm here. Keith, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Remember now, we're not cutting in. Y'all are all cut off while these people are talking. And then we're going to, after you send it a message that you need to be on, you're on. But you're cut off during this. Let them do their presentation, and then we will open up and let you talk. Keep your mics off. That was something that everybody said we were going to do when we talked about it. Was that Mike, correct? Or? Mike, I'm having a problem with my mic, and it's taking me too long to get it back on when I turn it off. And last time you had to ask five or six times, I was afraid you were going to move on. So that's why I'm keeping mine on. Because I can't, I hit the clicker and it clicks, 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 and sometimes it takes and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. All so, right. What else? What's next? Okay, so, so to continue with the with the recommendation, we looked at going to a Tuesday through Thursday, beginning next week. Uh, a list uh, contingent on the food supplies we can get as well, so that way our our staff can get much needed rest, get a four day weekend uh, here to to spend time with their families and take care of their personal needs. So moving forward, our our recommendation would be going to a Tuesday through Thursday distribution with providing meals for the days thereafter. So we can provide multiple uh, meals during those distributions. Uh, that's that's kind of where we're at with that uh, task force that's looking at it. Uh, additionally, uh, we are documenting it as part of our multi-hazard emergency operation plan, our school closure plan that Brandon put together uh, in the four-phase plan. We are currently in a three, 3.5 phase. Uh, we're not in complete shutdown at this time. Uh, most of the employees are working remotely with minimal staff on site to ensure that uh, essential instruction and operations continue. Uh, in order for uh, for us to submit for FEMA reimbursement, we have to document this as part of our multi-hazard emergency operation plan. So we are developing this functional annex, uh, the SCOOP plan, uh, the school continuity of operations plan, and then any of the additional documents we're doing for instruction and for feeding. Uh, those will all be part of our overall multi-hazard EOP plan. And uh, we'll present that at a later time just for you guys to review it. And more than likely, we're going to need to modify what we approved a few years back to adjust to the current needs at this time. Um, instructionally, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, hand this over to Dalila and her staff. And uh, Dell also has the Wi-Fi flyer, Dalila, so they can pull up on where our sites are for the parents. Thank you. Um, I think Thank you. He just did that. Wi-Fi areas. Uh, the Wi-Fi areas, that's the part that, Mark, did you already speak to that? No, I will, Dalila. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so we have about 400 Wi-Fi devices that we've sent out. Uh, these are the devices that we currently had on hand. We had about 200, then I ordered 200 more. I have 200 more coming someday. So we have about 400 devices that we sent out and got out into our community for those that don't have Wi-Fi. We also, there's a flyer here. We've opened up uh, four sites across the district in strategic areas that we have great Wi-Fi access outside so that... Uh, you know, teachers, employees, and students and parents can go and pull up and get on a district device and, and use Wi-Fi. Uh, and that's Tuesday through Thursdays, four to seven. And so that's another option to help them. The, the last thing I want to talk about before I turn it over to Dalila is I need to talk about budget and finance and let the board uh, know what, what's kind of going on. Obviously, most of you know that the, the economy, Texas economy, is, a, a, is, is in a, a, a different place than it was three months ago. This morning, the uh, comptroller uh, came out and talked briefly about and explained what's going on with the Texas economy. And he was basically said it was doing great earlier in the year, uh, but the combination of the pandemic and then the oil dr uh, price drop has basically sent us, and he said the words, into a recession. Uh, he said the nation could end up in a double digit unemployment, and he kind of went on how that impacts Texas. Uh, he basically is recommending across the board and uh, to state agencies, and under that, we would be consider something similar to that to start looking now for savings. 
uh, on cuts and how you would deal with uh, a difficult budget session in the next biennium. Uh, he is recommendation. Some of his recommendation is freezing new hires, ma not making salary adjustments, and then looking for other opportunities to save. Uh, because they asked him about the revenue estimate for the next biennium, and he couldn't answer what the revenue estimate is going to be for this biennium. Uh, and so he's confident that he could use the uh, economic stabilization fund to fund currently next year. But after that, uh, they're talking several billions of dollars that are going to be lost in the economy. And so and we can almost be for certain in the next biennium that there'll be major cuts in the state budget. Obviously, uh, school districts is a uh, big part of the budget. And so we can guess best guess that probably the school districts will face cuts similar to what we saw the 08, 09 in that time period. Uh, and currently for us as a district, we have two things that we have to really monitor and that's our property values. Currently our BCAD, uh, Bear County uh, appraisal districts working through protests, but they're having to figure out how to do those protests without having meetings. And so uh, there, are, there are people out there, they're gonna look at property values and protests now more than ever. We have to look at our, our collection rate. Uh, we usually have about a 95 to 97% collection rate uh, based on uh, the economics that could be lowered. And so that could impact our budget. And then working through our revenue template and working on through ADA, we're able to use this year's ADA to kind of look at next year's projection, but we're not gonna get a true picture of this year's because uh, we're not gonna, we don't have ADA for the, 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 you know, the third of the last part of the, uh, uh, of the school year. And so we have some challenges for property values. We have some challenges for ADA and, and determining our revenue. Uh, and so I'm gonna bring more to you at the next board meeting. Uh, I didn't wanna bring in, uh, talk about this too much because I know we have a lot of things going on, but we are really gonna have to start looking at budget. Normally today I'd be giving you a budget workshop talking about next year and staffing. Uh, but now we have a lot of unknowns and I wanted to share that with y'all so that I could be upfront. Uh, and transparent on what, what we're seeing from our side and what we're hearing from our people that are dealing with the budget and the finance with the state legislators and uh, what the future may hold for us. And so uh, I'll answer any questions now, but I'm gonna plan to bring you more at the next board meeting with more of an items information really focused on budget uh, and where we are. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dalila because I know she has greater things to talk about than the <laughs> budget, so. Thank you, Brendan. So just a real quick overview of where we are at when it comes to the instructional delivery of our online and remote. Um, last week, we attended several webinars through TEA. And basically, what TEA is just coming back is creating a framework for all the work that has already happened and that we've already doing. So we're almost at the forefront when it comes to that work. So we feel good about that. And um, over the week, they also discussed uh, grading guidelines. So that is something that we've already pushed out. We went ahead and got input from all sorts of leadership on the campus level. We had a group for elementary, a group for middle school, and a group for high school. We wanted to hear their input as far as how they felt these grading guidelines would move forward with. Now we know that we feel confident that either the students have a paper packet or if not, they do have this online device. And uh, we have principals that are checking in with teachers to make sure that the teachers are available for the students. So there is a lot of structures that have been put into place where the principals are checking in with the academic coaches, academic coaches meeting with grade level teachers. And so now what we are asking is for the principals to make sure that students are engaged in the work. So now that we have pushed out the work, whether paper packet or online, we want to come back and make sure that we have a good number of students that are engaged in the work. And so part of that is we haven't really changed our grading policy. What we did is we looked at other school districts just to see, you know, how could we continue the learning because we're talking about an entire six weeks and a half. So we didn't want to just come back and say, well, whatever grade they got up until now, but continue to push the need for the students to learn at home. Also, we do understand that some students do not have the same uh, capability. And then also we are asking for parents to really do a lot of, you know, the, the, not the teaching, but just in ensuring that the students are completing the work. So we are kind of like just juggling with all of that, but we do have this distance grading guidelines that we have created for elementary, middle school and high school. And it did get posted yesterday at noontime. So with this, we're still gonna come back and we need to come back to the board and do some tweaking with this remote learning and, and grading guidelines. We will be doing that. 
um, the question is how many students are actually engaging in the work that we are currently pushing out. And so that'll be something that we're going to start monitoring on a weekly basis now that we have already sent out the, the a second set of paper packets. We did the four, fifth, and sixth week paper packet. And so we didn't want for principals to be there physically handing them out. So some of them we did ask for distribution and we thank them for that. For them to be available so these packets would be mailed home. So we are mailing the packets home also. Principals are taking uh, control of that. We also had some campuses who opened up, you know, their 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 not their doors, but their patios basically <laughs> at the delivery area. The packets have been available for parents to just come and pick up the packets as needed. So we have a good number of our students that are participating online, and we do also have a way for us to be tracking that information. And so for that, it really has taken an effort from our principals who have really stepped up as well. And um, that's pretty much it, that we're moving forward. It looks positive, but at the same time, the word that we're saying is we're being flexible and understanding with the needs in our community. Thank you. Questions, board members? I have a question. Please. Okay. Uh, yes. Daniela, do you have a percent of participation of students? Yes, we are currently, this morning we were going through an Excel sheet. So initially the percentage was how many students took the devices. Now we're coming back and some campuses have already reported the percentage of students that are participating. So the fact that we pushed out the grading guideline. On the grading guideline, it really just is on the core content areas, we would like for them to post two grades. And that those grades are not grades per day, but that's in a weekly basis. So that kind of goes hand in hand with if there's grades posted for the students, that means that we do have some participation that is happening. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is something that we're going to be monitoring closely, but the principals are gathering this data and then they're posting this data on a spreadsheet that we created about three weeks ago. So that is something that has been um, asked. We've got like 80 percentiles, we've got 90 percentiles, and it, it really just, um, it really varies campus to campus because like Media Creek, for example, I think they only have six written packets, six paper packets that are being mailed out. So the majority of the students are online. And so that was really definitely our, the approach we wanted to take, but we also understand that some students need the paper packets. And so for that reason, those are the ones that, you know, principals are making, are ensuring that these kiddos and these packets are getting to their homes. Okay. Ida? Did you have something? Ida, are you up? I, I don't have a question. I don't have a question. Okay. I was just, you want me to thank her? That's what you were going to thank her. Do you want to do it? I'll do it. Thank you very much for going over, over all this. We appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Versta, do you have anything else? Yes, sir. Somewhere, I don't see you. I just want to um, tell the board you guys made history. I think this in the 68 year history of Southwest ISD this is probably the first virtual board meeting, uh, at least that I'm aware of. Um, You're not going to hide it somewhere? <laughs> no, we're not hiding anything. Uh, but I just, uh, you know, we're you have, what, did you have a closed session on this? No, sir. Uh, Good. We do not. Good. <laughs> So I just want to thank everyone for, for your, your patience, for being uh, um, very fluid in what we're doing, for supporting uh, all the things. We've got some really great people at Southwest ISD, and, and I know I've thanked them and couldn't be prouder, and, and that's just the reality of it. And that's from our teachers, our custodians, transportation, child nutrition. I think uh, our kids get a lot of support because of things and decisions you guys made in the past. Uh, we'll continue moving forward. Uh, you know, I got on my truck this morning when I got here and um, we talk about being resilient during this time and, and being positive and look towards the future. And we do that. Uh, but I, I had a smile because uh, normally at this local cafe, there, there's this group of folks that have been meeting there every morning for years and years and years. And obviously you can't do that now. So I seen this morning when I got out in a parking lot right across from Dollar General here, uh, they had their vehicle they brought their own coffee circled their vehicles had social distance uh and instead of stopping uh, that morning ritual uh they just changed it and it's kind of a you know it's kind of parallel to what we're doing here uh we're not stopping teaching and learning uh we just changed it and, and we move forward and, and during this time uh your heart uh can smile at some really great things 
one I'm going to mention, and then I'm going to give my one more thing to Val here. Uh, I, I really want to thank people like Francis Barcenez, Donna Schweers. I know there are others involved, uh, but this past weekend, uh, they went home and instead of uh, relaxing, what they did is get out their sew kits and they made over 100 masks uh, to make available uh, for uh, our employees who are on the front line. And, and uh, when we talk about service heart, uh, those are examples. No one asked them to do it. No one said, can you do it? Uh, they just saw a need and they stood up, stood up and they do that, uh, I, which I think it just uh, uh, resembles a lot of people in our district. So I just want to make sure that um, you guys know, I know you know, uh, that we have some incredible people. And, and then I'd like to turn, Mr. President, my one more thing over to uh, Valerie Maldonado, and she'd like to make an announcement, if that's okay with you. All right. I might yes. give you two things so later. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Verster. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. I just wanted to mention, again, along the lines with having a service heart, um, I just wanted to make mention of two of my nurses who were called to action, and they are actually in New York City helping uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So it takes a special kind of person to really um, feel that calling and have that calling to go over and and really into a very dangerous situation. And so I just wanna commend them, Christy Shanefelter at Medio Creek and Yanni Tovar at McAuliffe. Um, again, service hearts like you wouldn't believe, uh, very heroic. They are in New York helping to fight the good fight and helping to save people over there. So again, I just wanted you all to, to, to know about that. Um, there are really great people in our district moving mountains yeah. to make this all all happen. So thank you all. Great people to do that. Great. And that's all we have today, sir. All right. I guess I'll close this thing down then. Um, but let me ask you one thing. Uh, I know everybody's doing the best they can, but over time, can we arrange where board members have their face on the right hand side and then who's who is actually presenting on the left. It's kind of hard for one board member to come up at one time and then 10 times later, maybe they're up there and they're down next. Is we it possible that we were worked on that? Yes, sir. We can definitely research and see uh, what capabilities and parameters we have with, with Zoom or, or, or Google. Okay, I just appreciate it if y'all can work on that. And I know the board members would uh, does any board members have any questions or anything before we close down? No, sir. I guess it's just you and I, Yolanda. Everybody <laughs> else has it turned off. Ida has it turned off. I don't. I don't have anything else, Mike. I appreciate everybody's hard work. Thank you. That's a comment, and that's good night. You did a good job, but okay. let me let me uh. Make one suggestion, be sure and charge up your device before you get here. <laughs> Good advice. You can show it up with one bar. I'm not catching on. What did I do wrong? His device died during the meeting. Who's? Dr. Barr. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to close it down. It is 105 and it's all over.